one of the things that we sorry got that we know that every congregation is different in terms of what average attendance experiences are life in their life is like with regard to, to policing but we also feel that within a congregation's experiences can vary widely our hope is that by this little teach-in you all will have just like terry mentioned enough information to go back to your congregation and talk to them about the ECPS and what's gonna be coming. Um, some of you may have been following this carefully or at least seen a little coverage on television. Some of it may be new to you. So the slides hopefully will lay it all out in pretty simple language. And of course, you know, we, we're available to help if you'd like to do a presentation in your church. There are several of us that are trying to be prepared as a, a speakers bureau, but if you can do this on your own, we think that's even better and we can share the slides with you or, or, or the back sheet or any of the other things that we've developed. Um, this, of course, you're choosing to attend this. So, you know, if it's a mission moment and you tried to do that in your church, you would just have a very short period of time, but it would be enough of a trigger that then maybe people would come up and ask you questions about it, or you could then say, let's have an in-person meeting and I'll explain more about it. Um, we can help you with that too, if you'd like. Now, keep in mind that because this is the first time you might be exposed to this, or it might be the first time you try to expose your fellow congregants to this, people won't leave with a full understanding of it, but, but that's okay. We want them to understand the gist and we keep thinking that training can get better the more people ask questions and the more time we spend on it. So that's kind of the way we've been thinking about it as we worked on these slides. Actually, we have to thank Jane because Jane did these slides originally for her congregation and then we stole them and kept modifying them for our use. So thank you, Jane. Um, our purpose tonight. Is that up? There we go, thank you. Our purpose today is that we want to present factual knowledge about the ordinance so that you understand it and understand it well enough that you know what the new ordinance can do and that you can then start sharing the information with others in your network. One of the things we're, we're pretty cognizant about is that the way adults tend to learn is that we have to hear the facts, we have to understand them, we can start talking to others, which builds our skill in talking about them. And then as we do that, it sort of changes our attitude. It can change the attitudes of people who hear us. And eventually it helps us change values. And that's of course, what we'd like to do with the police department and uh, the others in the city that we need to hold accountable. Okay, next slide. So this is our little history slide. This has got a lot on it. And I'm gonna both read through the groups that were involved, but not use the acronyms, you've got the acronyms on the slide, so you can see that. Um, this is a sort of a how did we get here kind of a slide. So you'll, uh, you'll, you'll, I'm going to try to explain each one as we go through it, but essentially this started with the murder of Laquan McDonald in 2016. And at that time, Man, Mayor Emanuel launched the Police Accountability Task Force, of which Lori Lightfoot was the chair, which is why we really thought she was with us on doing a civilian oversight um, council. So he established that PATF or that police accountability task force. And one of its recommendations was to set up a civilian oversight board. That became the foundation to Grassroots Alliance for Police Accountability or GAPA. Now GAPA is the group that CRS was most involved with and it included CRS, the Inner City Muslim Action Network, the IMAN, the Jewish Council on Urban Affairs, the JCUA, the Southwest Organizing Project or SWOP, the Target Area Development Corporation and One North Side. And all of them together had weekly or biweekly meetings to focus on the gap of ordinance and what we wanted to see pass in the city. There was another group, which was, I think, what we might call more street smart, and that was the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, or CARPER. They too had their own ordinance called CPAC, and there was a period of time where GAPA and CPAC did not see eye to eye on what we thought the ordinance should contain. And then this last year, when I kind of came on board, the two coalitions started talking together because we realized that Neither group could get its ordinance passed without the other. 
And just as we did that, the mayor came up with her own ordinance. <laughs> and then when the mayor came up with her own ordinance, for a while there, we thought it might be dead in the water because of that. But luckily, the mayor kind of didn't get the support she thought she was going to get. And so she pulled her ordinance. Public Safety Committee, which is the ordinance's first place of discussion and debate, passed it, and then it went on to city council within a week. So we were really surprised, but essentially July 21st was the day that this all became real for us, and so we're very excited. Are there any questions about that short history, or anybody want to add something? Can I ask a question? Sure. Um, and, if, and if it's related to, if this is better for later, let me know. But do you find like there um, that there are some real misconceptions about how this ordinance came about that tends to be um, uh, something that we can help clarify in our outreach and advocacy? Well, that is a great question. In terms of the history, in terms of how it came yeah. to be or anything? Well, I, I'll answer, but I'd like Sarah and Jane and Cindy to jump in too. I think that it helps people to know that there was tension among various groups and that the, the various groups began to compromise because we realized we weren't gonna get it passed if we didn't. But I don't wanna go into, oh, the other group wasn't thinking legally enough or the other group was too liberal or, you know, I would try to be avoiding those qualitative terms because I think the recognition that we all had to be somewhat in sync to get this through the city council was the important learning lesson. Anybody want to add to that? I think the history is important. I would say that you know all of us were working towards the same goal though, which was civilian oversight. I think we all recognize the need for it and the need for change. So um, you know there there were like there were times where you had to stop and start, but um, I, you know, in the interest of us moving forward together, we were united in what that should like the overall reason why we wanted to come together. There was tough though. There were times when it was sort of like one group wasn't talking to the other. So we went through some rough waters but essentially we did come out with something that we're pretty happy about. I think everybody's generally pretty happy about it. So I, I think you could suggest that if you're talking to members of your congregation. Anything else? Okay, next slide then, Sarah. So what is it gonna do? So it's essentially set up to provide civilian oversight of the Chicago Police Department and other policing bodies in Chicago. So it is limited to the city. It should, I mean, hopefully it will fundamentally transform the relationship between the Chicago Police Department and the communities that it serves. And thirdly, it's meant to increase public safety and build trust. So it's kind of one of those things where our highest aspirations went into the crafting of what we thought the ordinance could do. And now we're at that position where we'll see if the people elected to serve can help us actually realize this. And that's where I'm afraid we may see uh, considerable uh, pushback. So next slide. We feel like we need civilian oversight because, you know, just like a lot of other departments, there's in other cities, there's a history of abusive, racist behaviors on the part of different officers. And of course, it's, as you like to hear people say, it's not all of them, but it's enough of them that we need to change culture and attitude. And Laquan McDonald and Rakia Boyd's deaths were just examples of where the police department really went wrong. And then they tend to go through a period of cover up and denial and all of that. So. The individual cases of police brutality tend to result from poor screening, a lack of training or just poor training or not enough training, um, department policies that aren't necessarily as clear as we'd like to think they are, disciplinary procedures that don't discipline really, um, you know, the blue wall of silence or that code of silence, which a lot of police departments are known for. And then, of course, there are people who simply lie and try to cover up. So. 
trying to bring an injection of democratic input into how the CPD operates and how its leadership is chosen and held accountable is the primary thrust behind why we need that. We would like to see the relationship between communities and the CPT as not being adversarial, but in many communities it it obviously is. And we've all heard stories, or if we haven't had the experience ourselves, where police abuse has occurred, but no action was taken. So that's those are the primary reasons behind why we want to do this. So let's take a little look at what it's going to be like. So there are essentially going to be two councils. The first one is going to be the community commission, and that's citywide, and it will have seven people. The second one is for district councils. And that means each police district, and there are 22, will have three members elected by the community of that district who also select and set priorities for the smaller community commission. So the rollout of this and how these people are going to be appointed and or elected is what we need to work on in the next year and a half to two years. So those seven members that are gonna be on the council, on the commission, they are to represent two from the south side, two from the west side, two from the north side, and one other. But they also have some mandates about the kind of representation that they can, can make up. So I thought that was on this slide, but it must be on the next one. Um, let me go on to, yeah, here we go. The seven-person commission has to have two young people who are between the ages of 18 and 24, it must have two attorneys, so we, got, we have to have legal knowledge in this body in order to be effective, and at least one community organizer with 10 years of experience. And there is no exclusion for criminal records or felonies. Now, the, the way those district councils are supposed to work is that people are gonna be nominated, and then there's gonna be an election. The first round of the seven person commission is gonna be appointed. And that's probably going to be by the mayor, but maybe with some suggestions from community bodies. And then it has to be approved by the city council. Um, it, there is a residency requirement for being on the seven person commission. And the commissioners will be paid a stipend of 12,000 a year. The president of the commission will get 15,000. Now the districts, which are the smaller bodies, but when you put them together, it's 66 people. So that's a lot. 22 districts times three people is 66 people in elected office. They hopefully will be getting training in their district council that might elevate them for the seven person commission or other elected offices. And they too are gonna get small stipends of $500 a month. And there is a budget for this. So there, there will be staff and we hope that the staff can help support all of what we've been advocating for through the creation of the ordinance and its passage. So I think that's about it for the numbers. Are there any questions about the constitutionality of this, the way it's gonna be made up? This is what we meant by saying, we'd love to see members of your congregation running for district councils, or even if you know somebody that has a chance at the seven member commission, seeing if we can't elevate some names for that. Okay, so what are the powers that the commission is going to have? So they will play a central role in selecting and or removing the police superintendent, the civilian office of police accountability's chief administrator, and members of the police board. They are going to be setting policy or at least recommending policy. They will be establishing goals and evaluation of progress for both CPD and COPA, that's the City Civilian Office of Police Accountability and the board. They are going to be able to make budget recommendations and hopefully they're going to get really good at doing research and identifying and recommending what are the preventative, proactive community and evidence-based solutions to violence in our communities? All of this is in an effort to promote community engagement and transparency. So I think that the key role here is knowing that even though they're not going to be a singular power that can do all these things, they have to do these in conjunction with the mayor and the city council, having us involved in naming people and putting people together in a way where we might get greater dialogue and more involvement with the police and us as community members 
is going to be really welcome. Um, we hope that the people we pick will be supported by the mayor and by the city council. We won't know that till we've gone through our first round. Um, but we also have a role in watching those leaders because if they're not performing to the degree that we think they should be, or we're not seeing the kind of course change that we need, then we need to start talking about whether or not somebody needs to be removed. We won't have the power to remove the superintendent, but we would have the power to go to the mayor and say, we think the superintendent needs either discipline or needs to be removed. And there's been a lot of conversation about that lately, by the way. The policy piece is, is tricky because it includes that civilian office of police accountability and the police board. So that's a lot of bodies, but it's an extremely important power that the commission is gonna have. So um, I know some of you know about the consent decree and some of you know that there are subcommittees dealing with a consent decree. Getting community engagement on what the police should be doing and how that's written in policy is a really hard thing. And even when we read the policy, sometimes we can't, we can't figure out exactly what it's telling the police to do. So if we can't understand it, I'm having a hard time believing the police can understand it. So we believe that the civilians playing a key role in this policy making process, that we're going to get better policies that should reflect better practices and broader community values. Um, the CPD is always able to draft policies. It, it is now and it will be in the future. But with this added element of a civilian oversight commission, we will be involved in looking at what it is that they propose. And then ultimately the commission will vote. Um, the mayor has the power to veto any policy passed by the commission. City council can override that veto. So you can imagine a situation where the council and maybe the districts have done some work on a policy that maybe we could say it's the, the foot, the, the foot, what do they call it when, when cops chase somebody on foot? Pursuit. Yeah, I've forgotten the phrase that the policy has in it, but let's say we came up with a new policy about that. We like it, the districts like it, the commission likes it, the mayor doesn't like it. So she vetoes it. But then it goes back to the city council and the city council can say, no, no, we like it. And they can override her or him. So the last thing to think about is how do these bodies actually engage in a process to set annual goals, to make sure that the budget reflects adequate funding and resources to meet those goals and ways to improve public safety and public health without police involvement. It's part of the decree and the work of the subcommittees is on, there are two pilots right now where we have social workers going on police calls in two districts. So they are going out with a police officer in the hope that a police activity isn't necessary. Um, so that's where we're gonna be playing around with some of the mental health initiatives that the consent decree has demanded. And then of course the commission and the districts can work with their communities, you know, they can provide um, teach-ins themselves, they can hold public meetings, they can require or ask the superintendent to come in and talk about issues that are important to a particular committee. And of course, they can conduct their own research, publish reports, and hold hearings on important issues. So that was a mouthful. <laughs> I'm going to stop and see if there are any questions. Nope. Okay, so let's look at the district councils. Briefly, the hope is that those councils are going to establish stronger connections between the police in that district and the community. It's like the school boards being elected locally and having closer relationships with the faculty and the staff of the schools. Um, they are expected to hold monthly public meetings where residents can work with police on local issues, raise concerns, they are expected to, I mean, I think this is what could happen depending on how effective the public meetings are. They could get to know some of the leaders in the community and especially your churches so that they feel like they've got resources available to them that go outside the police department itself. So they can work together on setting priorities. They can start to define what public safety looks like for a neighborhood. I'm sorry, baby, you gotta stay over there. <laughs> cry 
Yes? No? She's a little quiet. Hello. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm hearing her. I just don't know if that's coming across to you. Um, and of course, they're going to be recommending people for the city commission, for the county, the whole community committee. There she goes. I knew she was going to come up. Yeah, I'm sorry. She looked like she was ready to take a dive. Um, they'll, so they'll be selecting people they think the community commission should include, and they will be bringing strategies such as restorative justice into the district. So think about it in the smallest local level was the district, then there's the whole city. And then of course the other powers that be are the mayor, city council, and this is not even including what's gonna happen when the, the police contracts come up for renewal and we're dealing with the FOP. So the Fraternal Order of the Police, which is the police union, obviously is not in here, but they'll, they're definitely one of the places I think we're going to see some significant pushback. So I'm going to turn it over to Cindy, and she's going to actually show you what this looks like graphically, and then add a few more elements that we haven't talked about yet. Okay, so you can see here that the commission um, will have four commissioners that each have four year terms and then three commissioners with two year terms. The district council will have three direct counselors, district counselors per police department, uh, 22 police departments. So a total of 66 district counselors. Um, one really great thing that um, we put into this ordinance was having two advisory councils, uh, the immigrant advisory council for the commission to you know, uh, help build relationships with the community and provide policy recommendations. Same thing with the uh, youth advisory councils. There will be one per district. Uh, so um, we we really felt strongly that those it was important to have that kind of input into both of these bodies. Um, we'll go into more details regarding each of these councils in the next few slides. So first we have the Immigrant Advisory Council. Uh, the purpose is to give non-citizens and immigrants a voice in policing and public safety. They'll meet with the commission to provide their input and recommendations. And me these members will serve for two years and they'll be selected by the commission after an open application process. All right, on to the Youth Advisory Council. Um, the purpose of this council is to inform district councils of issues important to young people uh, related to policy, uh, policing and public safety. There'll be one youth advisor per police district for a total of 22 youth advisors. Um, we haven't really established the framework for this, the appointment of these youth advisors yet. Um, so we will be doing that, um, you know, over the next couple of years, I would guess. So, um, all right, next slide. Okay, so as far as the ECPS uh, timeline, um, now that the ordinance has passed, um, we have to you know, really get our ducks in a row here. Um, as you can see, the process to select interim commissioners is starting now with the naming of interim commission candidates in December of this year. The mayor will officially appoint the interim commission on January 1st. Um, then the campaign season for the district council positions will go from May 2022 to February 2023, uh, with elections being held that month, February 2023. Um, district council members will be inaugurated and set up by May 23rd of 2023. Then the following month, the commission selection committee will begin the process of electing, selecting nominees for the commission and appointments will be made in December with the commission up and fully running in January, 2024. Uh, okay. So what we're really here to talk about today is some of the opportunities for us as CRS members um, and you know, members of our, our congregations, uh, organizations that we belong to, to engage in this process because it's only gonna work if we engage. Um, first, uh, we believe we can play a role in the selection of the interim members of the citywide commission, community commission. Uh, we need to propose nominees by November 1st. Uh, an application form has been developed and we need help in getting that distributed to those interested in being recommended. 
Um, the second thing we can do is start recruiting candidates for the district councils. So identifying people from our uh, communities and congregations who would make good members and encourage them to run. Um, and then, you know, really educate and encourage our communities to participate in the election in February, 2023. So that's down the road a bit, but those are all activities that we're going to be very engaged in both as a CRS's uh, police issues team, but also, you know, encouraging um, our members. And also we, you know, we're still in coalition with, um, you know, GAPA and CARPER and so, all of the organizations that are involved um, are doing these same things. A CRS isn't trying to do it by itself. Um, we've got lots and lots of people involved in this uh, to you know, just really make sure that we're reaching in into all areas of the community. Oh, you can go back to the last one, Sarah. The next thing we have will need to do is to recruit candidates for the permanent commission in late 2023 or early 2024. So, you know, again, reaching into our communities and our congregations and encouraging qualified people to apply to be commissioners. And then also reaching out to our local district councils to support uh, highly qualified candidates. All right, now you can go to the next slide. So, you know, why does this matter to our city? Why is, why is ECPS important? You know, we really hope that ECPS will help improve the relationship between the police and our communities. We know that other cities across the country have been successful in reducing the use of violent force by police officers, increasing accountability and improving community relations um, and safety. And, and we know that ECPS uh, can can do to can do the same for us um, if we just, you know, really keep at it and and make sure that all the things that this this ordinance calls for, you know, come come into play. Um, and and we really hope you will uh, join us in this effort. So I don't think we need to to do a breakout session. I think we can just you know talk as a group. Um, and so, uh, do you want to put the questions in the chat, Sarah? Yeah, we can do that. And then maybe we can just address those together. Um, sure, give me a second. Like, what I'll we'd work. like to discuss is, you know, what did you see or hear today that, um, and how did you feel about it? And, you know, do you have any questions on any of this? And how do you think you can get your congregation or groups to, to engage? Um, I know, Terry, you had brought up that you were interested in knowing about the referendum piece. Sarah, do you want to address that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're working with, uh, right now, the coalition is focused on, on this interim co uh, commission and setting that up. And so we have to figure, once we can get that done, the coalition's going to come together and we're going to figure out the strategy to, to promote and move the referendum piece. But at this point, we don't have more details. Um, we're getting out information about the referendum and what that's doing. We're trying to get sponsors, but um, we really just wanna focus on getting a strong commission established first before turning to that. Does that answer your question, Terry? Uh, I. I think so. I, I guess I was under the impression that um, that we were to, uh, you know, be talking to constituents about lobbying their uh, aldermen to get some support for the referendum. That is ongoing. And so if there, if you are able to talk to your um, alder person, uh, by all means, you know, you feel free to do that. Um, I think that's not something that we're like discouraging, but at this point, we're just trying to also make sure that we do have, can't, like our focus right now is still the applications. So if you are able to meet and la meet with your older person, um, you know, by all means, please go ahead and set that up. Thank you. So, so um, what did you feel about 
you know, what you saw or heard uh, about ECPS. Anybody? Do you, do you think it has the potential to do what it is intended to do? Do you have reservations about that or? My first reaction was what a bunch of alphabet soup. <laughs> <laughs> when I first got involved in this work, I felt like I had to look at my cheat sheets like every meeting because I could never remember what all these acronyms were. So I still think that's gonna be an issue. It's hard for people to overcome that. It, I don't know any way complex. around it. Yeah. It's complex and it's one of the things that some of the alders had a problem with it about, but you know, we just, after five years, we just felt this was, this was what we had to do in order to really build those relationships and change the way policing is done in Chicago. We needed, both that community commission and we needed those district councils. Mm -hmm. It seems like the district councils are critical because that is the most local, um, you know, position. And so, you know, neighborhoods and, you know, like the whole thing, all politics is local. I know it's a cliche, but I think it really does resonate. And I, um, I'm, I'm grateful for a lot of the work that GAPA, which now includes CPAC, right? Um, I'm grateful that the now that the ordinance has passed, um, the focus is going to be on educating folks about the ordinance and what it means to run for district councils and generating some support and perhaps recruiting people because, um, you know, I think that it's 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 so important, you know, that people from the public have a say and have a role and some influence and power, but because elections are involved, elections also have uh, created an opportunity, you know, for, for folks to just really make this go south, right? Um, and so the kind of recruitment and education and leadership development um, and folks from the community, uh, the kinds of folks we want to be in those positions being empowered to run, like that's a really key part of this ordinance. I, right after it was it was passed, you know, we were all, you know, a lot of jubilation and celebration. And then then it like hit us like this is just beginning. Like we have we've got to keep our eyes on this. Like we have to make sure that the people who run and get elected are the ones who should and the ones who, you know, get nominated for the commission. They they got they've got to have they've got to have um, good intentions. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's what you have to keep, we have mm -hmm. to keep our eye on. You know, I kind of think that most, this does strike me as being one of the more progressive civilian oversight bodies in the country. I know there are some other cities that have done similar things. They're not exactly the same, but I have to tell you my hometown is Cincinnati, which I think is a very racist city. It's very, it, it's a very Southern like city, even though it's in Ohio. And I cannot imagine one that they would ever pass such an ordinance there. But even if they did, I would be so worried about who was gonna get elected. And here I'm not as worried, but if we're not out in force and don't get people we think would be really good and progressive in those positions, we run the same risk. Mm -hmm. Terry? Uh um, so what um, what do you, what do you worry are, what are you worried about in terms of the people that will be um, on the on the commission? Like, um, what do you think they do? You think they will not be progressive enough, that, or they'll be? That's what you think. Okay. Well, or, I, I think might be our, pro police. Yeah. yeah our, Watching what happened in city council and watching what happened in the public safety committee. Yeah. I mean, we were sort of blown away when people we thought were supporting us suddenly stopped. And we're like, oh, who, who did they talk to or who talked to them? Yeah. And how did that influence their decision not to vote for the ordinance? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that was the first go round. The second go round went much better. But and then there were a couple of city council people who, even though I didn't really know much about them, they were real. They were 
pieces of work. We, we have alders who believe that everything is just fine with policing in Chicago. And mm -hmm. our fear is that they might, you know, they might propose uh, candidates who, who really don't have in their heart reform. So I, th I think that's the thing that's, that scares me personally the mm -hmm. most. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I have a, yeah. Oh, I, I don't want to interrupt anyone. No. Okay, I have a question. Are there term limits on the council, district council positions? And if so, what are the term limits? Yeah, there are. And I have to look it up offhand if it's four years. Or if it's... I don't think I can even answer that. Yeah, okay. um, yeah I, oh, there yeah. are term limits and I can double check mm -hmm. how long those are. And I'm curious, are there any, um, and maybe this is just a broader issue of campaign finance reform, and it's not even specific to ECPS, but are there, is, are, are there any kind of restrictions on the amount of money that, um, that folks can get for the council positions? Um, are there like any, anything like that or no, or is it just state and federal law? In terms of like campaign, like raising money, Camp campaign, yeah, there's it's it's subject just to the state laws that that are already in place. Mm -hmm. Okay, All probably right. the same laws that um, maybe school board candidates would mm -hmm. be okay. under. I yeah. would guess. Okay, and I have one more question. I'm sorry. Um, uh, how long will campaign season be? Because that. Um, I think that's another important factor. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it's really long for the district councils. You know, it starts next February and goes until the next January. I mean, it's like really long. Mm -hmm. but so, so a year? So yeah. we, what we'll I'll say is like 10 May, months. May 2022 to February 2023 so yeah like nine oh, months like nine months yeah it's long mm -hmm. but maybe that's necessary i mean unless you've done an election like run for the local school board and obviously the school boards are still not as local you know in our model the, the local is your district so it's a smaller group but the local school boards are local to one school I don't think that I don't think those elections are nearly as long for those slots. They're they're not, and and they also it, it, it's interesting to think about how these um, district councils will be like the local school councils and how they won't be like oh. them. Mm -hmm. There's over 300 schools, so of course they're they're much more local, and they also are anchored by an actual school with some teachers and a principal, and parents mm -hmm. have to be part. It's it's, it's very different. In a way, um, there's more opportunity for the, um, the police district councils to play a big convening role in bringing more people in to, um, to decision making and well, recommendations more than decision making. And, um, and we don't know yet because we haven't seen it, but um, the whole idea of bringing more input in from the local level is the same for the local school councils and, and these new um, police district councils. I was just going back through my notes and I don't see the terms on here. So it that's four a, years. It is a four year. Is it four term. years? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and then, so there and then will be a rolling, rolling number of people that will go off. And then the, the three district, third, the three people district councils are like, every three, well, how would that work? I'm having trouble doing the math on that one because if they're if they're elected every four years, then you may have a year where there's nobody elected. They should, they will be staggered. Um, and I don't know, I have to look at the process of how yeah, they're yeah. going to be elected. Mm. But it won't be but, where it's like, oh, we <laughs> clean But Jane is right. I think the fact that the only other model we have are the local school councils, and yet they have an anchor, they've got a, a building, they've got principal, they've got faculty and staff. It's very different. We're gonna have staff, but that staff's gonna be in city hall. So they will have to, I mean, I just don't know how much staff will get to support the, the council, the district level councils. 
Any other We're building the plane as we fly it? Yes. <laughs> Have, do you have any thoughts on how you might engage um, as individuals with organizations you belong to or congregations, faith communities to kind of get the word out and, um, you know, recruit some candidates um, for the commission, some, nom you know, some candidates to be nominated. Any thoughts? Will we'll we um, be able to uh, use this slide deck that you're showing? Absolutely. Great. Great. And Absolutely. we have a fact sheet that Sarah had drafted a month or so ago. And I think the fact sheets can be passed out to people, which is also good. Thank I'm you. actually thinking, I come from a very large church. So I'm thinking, for me, it's going to be important to kind of handpick the folks that I've met that are committed to social justice and systems change and see if I can't get some of them to think about either running or suggesting other people that would be good. Mm -hmm. I think it's gonna take a lot of networking. Um, that's a good thing. Well, if you don't have any other questions or comments, um, we just wanna thank you for joining us today. And um, a special thank you to people who were involved in making these slides, which we will share with you. Um, and also we wanted to thank um, One Northside and uh, BPI for allowing us to use some of their slides that they're using in their presentations all over mm -hmm. the city. So thank you very much. Yeah. Okay.